ask you, raise of hands, how many in the last year have made an attempt to share the gospel with anybody, whether it's a stranger, friend, or family? Wow. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I love it. Thank you. How many had real difficulty trying that? Okay, that's most of you. Good, good, good. So, could you bring up the first slide? Thank you. We're going to go over the basics of evangelism. So, in Mark 16, 15, I'm sure you all know, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But oddly enough, in Matthew 9, 37, he said, The harvest is truly plentiful, but laborers are few. Isn't that odd? Jesus knows everything, right? He's God. He knew that his church would grow to over a million people. But why are there going to be few laborers? That's a weird combination of verses, isn't it? Next verse, or next chart, please. So there, there's our marching orders. That's written for every Christian. That's not for a subset of Christians. That's not for the apostles. That's not for people who are specifically called evangelists. Ephesians 4.11, when it talks about the office of the evangelist, his job is not just to evangelize. His job is to teach the church to do the ministry of evangelism among other ministries that are taught by the other offices in the church. So this command is for every Christian. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Next slide, please. So here's the simple message we want to get to the world, right? A lot of people have all sorts of ideas of what evangelism is. I bet if you go to Google and type in evangelism and go to an image search, the most common hit you're going to see is somebody, what? What do you think? Giving food to a homeless person. Something like that. Is there anything wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that. We should be doing that. That's a, it's a command from God, from Jesus, that we should be caring for the people who are homeless, we need food. But that is not evangelism. At least it's, it's not evangelism if you stop there with nothing more than just giving out food. I want you to think about this. Jesus warned that if they hate you, they, they hated Jesus first. Right? He warned that we will be persecuted. I guarantee you this. You can go into any country in the world, North Korea, Iran, if all you did was feed the homeless, nobody will persecute you. Okay? So, this is the basic message we need to get to the world. We're all sinners deserving of hell. You and me, all of us included. Jesus is God who loved us in spite of us, came into the world to die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins that we've incurred. Then he rose again. If we repent of our sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be born again, forgiven of our sins, that is the basic message we need to get out into the world. Yeah. That is the message that Christians are too afraid to tell everybody. Because there's a degree of exclusivity in this. If that means Buddha is not the way, Muhammad is not the way, atheism is not the way. Jesus is the only way. Yeah. And that's what divides the entire world. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you and I need to make a decision to be able to Die on that hill. Yeah. This is the hill you're going to die on. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide, please. So, I want to show you the wrong way to share the gospel. This is a very famous yeah. phrase from supposedly St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. First of all, St. Francis of Assisi never said that. Second of all, it's false. You can't preach the gospel without words. Yeah. You must use words, okay? You can't, you know, I'm not a mime, right? And you can't mime because Jesus died on the cross, you need to repent and believe in Jesus, right? Next slide. So this defines what we need to do as evangelists. This is the gospel. I'm going to read it to you uh, top to bottom and, and just break it down for you. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive in which you stand. So that word gospel, that's the apostle Paul saying, this is the gospel. And by the way, it had to be preached. It can't be pantomimed. 
It can be conveyed with a smile. It can be conveyed with the phrase, Jesus loves you. Although that's true, smiling is good. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. But it needs to be preached with words, either written or spoken. Okay? Second verse, by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So, what does this gospel message do for you? It saves you. It saves you from eternal destruction. Okay? It is the thing that every human being needs more than clothing, food, shelter, safety, water. We need forgiveness more than anything else. Verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. So there is the first main element of the gospel. Christ died for what? Our sin. We are sinners. The fact that we are sinners makes the gospel necessary. And then verse 4, And that he was buried, he rose again on the third day, according to the scripture. So that is our, our defining dictionary for what the gospel message is that we need to share to the world. Because Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature, right? So what is the gospel? It's right here. You can take a picture of it. See that uh, camera icon? That's a clue to you that you can take a picture of that if you want. Um, so that is how we're going to share the gospel. Um, next slide. So the basics, again, the gospel message, the gospel message is how someone is saved. It's the only way how anyone is saved. We need to be saved because why? We're all sinners. You must preach the gospel message with words, either written or spoken. The message needs to tell people that A, we're all sinners. B, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. C, he rose on the third day. D, this is the part that a lot of Christians don't know. Yeah. I've talked to so many people who go to church who have the most sweet Christian disposition. In fact, I was in LAX airport on the way here. I spoke to the lady at the um, currency exchange. She was this African lady with an African accent, most sweet disposition. She, she belongs to the Eastern Orthodox Church. You would swear she's Christian, but when I challenged her and asked her, asked her, can you tell me how to go to heaven? She looked puzzled. And she said, be a good person. She didn't know how to respond. Letter D, right there. We must repent of our sins and believe in Jesus for us to be saved. That is how you're saved. A lot of Christians, or at least church-going people, who think they're Christians, they know one through four C, right? But they don't know the last line right there. How are you saved? Anybody tell me. Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. I gotta hammer that nail home. Next slide. Okay. Now, if you want to boil it down, that was a lot to, to remember. You can take a picture of that too. Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and he rose again on the third day. Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. Okay? Let's boil it down some more. Next slide. Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. Okay? Can you remember that? Okay. So, next slide. So, when we go on the streets, ideally, we know that the Word of God has power, right? So we want to share the Scripture now and then to support what we're saying. And Scripture has a power of its own. So uh, most people like John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life, right? So faith in Jesus is how you're saved. But here's what I found on the street. The IQ of the world has dropped maybe 20 points in the last 50 years. Oh, almost nobody on the street that I've talked to in the last 15 years, when I show them this verse and I ask them to tell me what it means or how to go to heaven, they can't. They can't. So don't just assume that if you recite John 3.16 to somebody, they've gotten the message. So, um, go to the next slide. Uh, so some of the words in this verse are darkened. In this particular lighting, it's hard to see the words that darkened because I don't want to recite the entire verse because it's too much for most people to figure out what's going on. 
So the, the part of Acts 1631 that I like to share is just this part. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Sometimes I'll recite that verse to people and I'll say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Tell me how to go to heaven. And they'll tell me back, be a good person. And then you got to repeat it over. What I do is I make them tell me, believe in Jesus, repent of your sins. Because I don't feel satisfied that they heard me or they understood. Um, one more verse. Next one. Next slide. In John 6, 47. I'll preface this by saying, Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. So what's the common thread in all three verses? Believing in Jesus. So I didn't make this stuff up about believing in Jesus saves you. There it is three times in the Bible. Um, so make sure you get people to understand that it's faith in Jesus. Because do you, what's, the, what's the natural default thinking about how to make up for the sins that you committed? What's the natural default thinking, anybody? Did you say doing something good? Yeah, being a better person. Yeah, being a better person. So the natural thinking is this scales of justice sort of thing, right? I did something bad, I better do something good to balance it out. And because that, I believe that's the, the default thinking for every human being that's ever been born. And what else is going on is we're, we're fighting that default thinking, right? That by works, I can balance out my evil deeds. It doesn't work that way. But there's also a spiritual battle going on inside the hearts and minds of everybody you're trying to talk to. The devil wants to blind their, their eyes so they can't see the light of the gospel. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. So you have to make sure that they understood you. Yeah. Um, next slide. So make sure... I'm going to boil it down even more. Believe in Jesus, okay? So that, now you can't say you can't remember it, okay? <laughs> Next slide. Okay. Now we talked about works. I want to give you a, an analogy to help you understand that works can never balance out these or these. I use this on the street all the time. Imagine if your best friend is standing next to you. Or a person comes up and murders your friend right before your eyes. He gets arrested, the judge sentences him to life in prison. And this man who just murdered your friend says to the judge, Your Honor, you do not have to sentence me because you know what? The other day, I don't even hit me to somebody. He is now alive because of my generosity. I know I murdered this guy's best friend, but I also saved this person. We're now eating Stephen. You have to let me go, Your Honor. Does that work for the judge? Does that work for you if that was your friend who was killed? No. Good deeds do not cancel anything else. Right? Every evil act, every sin, every crime must be punished on the basis of that crime. Any good deeds have no bearing on the situation of that sin or crime. So we're stuck. We're in a bind, right? God is going to punish every sin. Somebody has to pay. Who paid for our sins? Jesus Christ. That's right. So, very often after I share the gospel with somebody and they say they believe, I'll ask them, do you go to church somewhere already? And sometimes they'll say yes. I'll say, what's the name of your church? And they'll say, Saint so-and-so. If they say Saint so-and-so, there's a good chance they believe against this passage here. Right? Saint so-and-so often teaches that you must believe in Jesus plus do an unspecified number of good works before you can be saved. Salvation by grace plus works. Is that the gospel? No, it's not the gospel. So on my gospel track that I have, that I um, designed, I have this verse. And if you see my videos, sometimes you'll see me whip it up and say, can you read this verse for me out loud? And they'll read, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, and the thing which you boast. And this verse is even worse than John 3.16. Nobody can tell me what Ephesians 2.8 and 9 is teaching them. Nobody. Zero. The, the look of confusion on their faces is, is stunning. So I have to break it down for them. So I encourage you to either have that verse ready on your phone somewhere. Maybe you have your Bible. If you're talking to a Catholic. They may not even know that the, their church teaches that you have 
do works to be saved. But just let them know. Hey, can you read this verse for me? Have them read it out loud. Ask them to explain it to you. And most likely they can. And you just go through word by word. For by grace you have been saved. What's grace? Grace is unearned favor. You don't earn it. You're saved. What's saved? Saved from destruction, saved from punishment, saved from hell. Through faith in Jesus. Okay? You're saved by believing in Jesus. Okay? And it is a gift. When somebody gives you a gift, did you earn that gift? Or was it just given to you because they wanted to give it to you? Because they wanted to bless you? You don't work for a gift. If you work for a gift, it's no longer a gift. It's payment. It's a paycheck. Yeah. It does not say, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Or it is a paycheck from God. <clears throat> right? And I'll point out, not of works. What does not of works in relationship to salvation mean to you? And they'll struggle. They'll struggle. And they'll say, it means you don't do good deeds. You don't have to do enough good deeds to be saved. You are saved the instant you truly repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. And then the good works will come after. The next verse talks about good works, but the next verse does not say you are saved by it. The next verse says that you are created for good works, that God laid out from eternity past for you to do. But by the time you're doing these good works, you are already saved. Okay? Next verse. Now, a lot of people are very afraid of sharing the gospel, and I know why. Because I was there. The first time I tried to share the gospel back in 2009, I literally shook in my boots. I almost couldn't say anything. I almost couldn't even have a gospel track. So I feel for you, okay, if you haven't done it before. But this is the key that will make your message make sense. This is the key that will show you how you can get their attention. And I've seen it so many times. If you watch my videos, you can see their face change when they understand that they're a sinner. So Galatians 3, 24 and 25, again, you can feel free to take a picture of that. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under the tutor. Let me repeat 24 again. Therefore, the law was our tutor. Now, some of you know your, your Christian theology. We're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. True. But there's still a job for the law to do. Yeah. Right? We're not saved by law. But we're convicted of our sins by law. Yeah. The law shows us who we are. It's a mirror. It shows how sinful I am. It shows me how much I need Jesus. Therefore, the gospel makes sense. And you notice what the law does in those three words. So that we could be justified by faith. See? Law and faith work together. We're not saved by law, but the law drives us to the cross so that we can be saved by faith. Okay? And I, I like to include 25 because I don't want people to think that after we're saved, we need to obey the law of Moses. Okay? You can eat all the bacon you want. That's fine. Okay? The law, the law of Moses was only for the Jews, only from Sinai to Calvary. In other words, the law of Moses ended at the cross. And it was only for the Jews. So that's what 25 is there for. Next slide, please. So even King David was talking about the usefulness of the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So do not underestimate the power of the law. Working hand in hand with the gospel. So you now know all the elements of a proper gospel conversation. And I'm going to ask my friend Cameron to come up and demonstrate a, um, a proper, typical evangelism conversation. Excuse me, sir. Can I ask you a question? Oh, of course. Yes. Can you tell me how to go to heaven? Uh, probably be a good person. You know, do, do good, more good than bad, I guess. Are you a good person? Yeah, I think so. Have you ever told a lie? I mean, yeah, but... What do you call people who tell lies? Uh, liars. <laughs> so what are you? Uh, liar. Have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you? Yeah. What do you call people who steal? Uh, steal with thieves. <laughs> You're a lying thief. Have your parents ever punished you? Yeah. That means you haven't always honored your father and your mother. 
Yeah. So by your admission, you're a liar, a thief, disobedient, rebellious. Is that a good person? Uh, no. <laughs> if you died today and God judged you, would you be innocent or guilty? Uh, guilty. Should God let guilty people into heaven? Uh, no. So where would you have gone if you had died yesterday? Uh, no. You said it, I didn't. Do you know what God did for you so you can be forgiven? Uh, Jesus. I think it's Jesus. Let me give you a little more information. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He loved you so much in spite of you and me not deserving his love. He came into the world, put on humanity, he became human and God at the same time. He lived a perfect life. He allowed himself to be punished for yours and sins and mine because he never sinned. You see, God is going to punish every sin. If he punished you for your sin, you would end up in hell. But if your sins were punished on Jesus 2,000 years ago, when you die, you won't have to be punished. Isn't that good news? Yes. But do you know what you need to do? God did everything he needed to do. Do you know what you need to do to be forgiven? Uh, no. Let me explain. In John 6, 47, Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. What do you have to do? Believe in Jesus. That's right. Believe in Jesus. Let me give you one more verse. I want to make sure you, you, you hear it, okay? Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. How do you go to heaven? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Excellent. So the, this message I just shared with you is called the gospel. It's the good news of what Jesus did for us to save us. Do you believe this message? Yes. In the Bible, in Romans 1.16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and salvation for those who believe. So according to the Bible, if you truly believe this message of Jesus dying on the cross for you and rising again for your sins, you can be saved. Let me ask you, young man, what is your name, young man? Uh, Cameron. Cameron. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you willing to lay down your life, lay down your sins, pick up the cross and follow Jesus, even if Jesus leads you to suffering and death, are you willing to start following Jesus now, no matter what it costs you? Yes. Can I pray for you? Yes. Can I put my hand on your shoulder? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So that... Yeah. That is an ideal conversation. And I've had many, many hundreds of ideal conversations on the street. You'd be shocked at how many people will go through that conversation with me exactly the way I want them to. You would be shocked. Even in the UK, that, I would say, it used to be a much more Christian nation, there is still a residue in the culture of the things we believe. You would be shocked at how rarely I need to break out my apologetics to prove the existence of God. Okay? You'd be shocked at how, how rarely somebody will say, well, how about homosexuals or whatever, right? I almost never get any pushback. So as much as I love apologetics, I'm a patient on the radio in Los Angeles on a show called Apologetics.com Radio Show. I almost never use it on the street. So focus on the main gospel message. And I'm going to give you a couple of resources. Uh, here's a name to remember. You might want to write this down. Ray Comfort. Okay? Search his name on YouTube. Uh, search my name, Tony Yu, T-O-N-Y, Y-U, and add the word evangelism to the search. And you'll find my videos. And you'll see hundreds and hundreds of examples of that kind of contradiction. So, to boil it down again, uh, my opening line to get to talk to people is, can I ask you a question? Sure. Can you tell me how to go to heaven? And that's how I talked to the lady at the LAX current station. Um, you'd be shocked at how that opens the door to the conversation. Let me explain to you why that's a, a really good question. Number one, nobody wants to go to hell. Number two, unless you're a Christian, you don't know what happens on the other side of death. Number three, everybody cares about that question. Number four, if you're like most Christians, you're the nicest people on earth, right? And you don't want to offend anybody, right? So your approach to talking to people is, to be very gentle and very nice. Let's say I'm talking, I'm trying to evangelize Cameron. Hi, um, how's your day going? You doing good? 
good today? Okay, if I take too long and I'm too nice, he's gonna think, what does this guy want? Go away. Like, it gets even worse if I'm talking to a female, right? All kinds of ideas jump in your head. So, number one, get to the point and get there fast. Number two, what you're selling, people want to buy. They want to know what happens when they die, okay? Nobody wants to go to hell if hell is real and hell can be avoided. So, number three, number whatever, number nine, whatever, <laughs> number of that. Um, this question is, is a spiritual diagnostic. How they answer your question tells you where they are spiritually. If they said, praise the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, I repented of my sins and believed in Jesus, okay, you can stop right there, you can just have a fellowship, okay? Um, if they say, Allah knows, okay? I know the Quran tells me X, Y, and Z. Then what, who are you talking to? A Muslim. If they say, uh, the Kingdom Hall tells me X, Y, and Z, who are you talking to? So, I'm not saying you need to know Muslim apologetics, although it's one of my areas that I love to study and use. Sometimes, all you gotta do is just share the gospel. You know why? The gospel has a power of its own, okay? Sometimes you don't need to go to Quran 33, 634 to show that the Quran says that the Bible is true, that the Bible is true, that the Quran is false. You don't necessarily need that. If you don't know how to argue against these different religions, just go straight to the gospel, okay? And make sure you, you break their, their uh, pride by showing them the sequence, okay? Just like I showed them on stage. Um, what time is it? Okay, we've got a few more minutes. So in 20 minutes, we're going out, right? Yeah. So are there any questions? many times. Um, I've had videos of, like one, one that jumps to my mind is I was at a mall, and there were two young men, maybe 18, 19. One was sitting down, the other one was sitting on his lap, and they were embracing. I shared the gospel with them anyway. They both prayed to receive Jesus. Now, whether they were truly saved, I don't know. You know what? Let me redefine the, the terms of success, okay? Success is not somebody falling down on their face crying and saying, Jesus is Lord, I repent, okay? When that happens, praise the Lord. But success for us is not defined by somebody necessarily believing on the spot. Because salvation is of who? The Lord, not of you and me. Our job is to share the gospel. As soon as we get the gospel out, we explain that we're all sinners, and that Jesus died on the cross for us, once again, and that if you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus, that's how you're saved. That's success, okay? So in the case of homosexuals, there are a number of approaches you can take. You can try to ignore the situation. And you can say, let, let me finish this first. Let me just explain to you how all of us can go to heaven. I'm a sinner too, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. And then you just go through the exact same conversation as just show you the camera, okay? So you can sort of defer it, defer it for a later time. If you choose to, um, Answer it straight on. I will say something along the lines of, is murder wrong? And they say, of course it's wrong. And the answer this, can we redefine murder as being good and not wrong? No. Okay, in the UK, they drive on the left side of the street. In the US, we drive on the right side of the street. In the US, could we change that law if we all had a vote? And let's say we unanimous to agree that we should drive on the left hand side? They said yes. Why are there some laws, like murdering is wrong, that we can't change, but driving on the left side or the right side is wrong or right, but we can change those laws? Why are there laws we can't change? Maybe because they don't come from us. Some laws don't come from us, no matter how much you want to change. Murdering kids for fun is always wrong. And no, no Congress, no Parliament can change that. There are laws that we don't control. 
the laws of sexuality as well. And then share the gospel. So there are a number of other ways you can uh, deal with the issue of homosexuality. And maybe for you, especially if you're not comfortable with apologetics and immediate confrontation or anger, try to defer it. Anything else? Hold on. So that's a good question because they're questioning all of our beliefs, right? They don't believe in heaven and hell, they don't believe the Bible. So my gospel fact that I knew that I designed, wrote, and printed up proves the truthfulness of the Bible. So you can one, you can ignore that. So let me just share the gospel with you anyway. So if you're not ready to defend your faith, um, avoid and say, let me just share this with you. Let me tell me what you think about it. Um, there are many, many approaches you can use to defend the truthfulness of the Bible. I mean, one of my favorite ways is this. Tell me what this verse is talking about. They pierced my hands and my feet. And I'll spread my arms out like this. And I'll say, what is that verse talking about? And they're going to say what? The crucifixion of Jesus. They pierced my hands and my feet. Well, that verse was written 1,000 years before Jesus came to the earth. It's Psalm 22, 16. It was written 600 years before crucifixion was invented. How did that happen? And some people don't get it. But some people, their eyes get really big. Right? Well, let me tell you how that happened. Because God is in control of history. He knows the future from the past. God put that in the Old Testament so that we can know that the Bible is in the truth of the God. Not the Quran, not the Hindu Vedas, not the Bhagavad Gita, okay? It's the Bible. The Bible is filled with fulfilled prophecy that proves that the Bible is true. And there are also many, many scientific facts that prove that the Bible is true, scientific or not. I don't want to go into that right now, but... Um, I'll give you one of my, my big gospel tracks. Okay? Another question. Is it okay for women to go singly or should be married at home? So, as far as I'm concerned, the Bible says it's perfectly fine for women to share the gospel anywhere, anytime they want. But there's an issue of wisdom. So, if you're going to a, an all-female event, maybe there's no problem at all. But we live in a very wicked world. Um, I would recommend if a woman wants to evangelize, she should have at least one other person with her, ideally a man. But, um, but I can't say, I would never say to a woman, you can't share the gospel unless you meet these criteria, right? Because I've heard, okay, I evangelize by myself maybe 70% of the time. I've had people tell me, no, Jesus sent them on two by two. But then I'll point them out to Acts 8. Well, Philip the Evangelist was sent out by the Holy Spirit. He was by himself. So there's more than one way to do evangelism. Any other questions? Perfect. So, I love apologetics. And I was sitting on the plane on the way out here with a, with a gentleman named Paul Wright. He's a British man. And um, we talked about the same thing. So, let's assume for the moment that evolution is true. The evolutionists claim that dinosaurs evolved from the birds. Is that right? And Darwinian evolution says that evolution happens over millions of small changes that are accumulated over time. So if that was true, there should be millions, maybe billions of transitional fossils between dinosaur and bird. How come we can't find one? How come we can't find none? In fact, transitional fossils should completely swamp these forms, like dinosaurs and birds, that we are thinking of as end forms, right? Why can't we find one? I mean, there should be for every dinosaur fossil, I should find a billion transitional forms. Yeah, that's right. 
there is no evidence for evolution. That's right. I believe the Bible because I believe in science. 